Assalamu alaikum, a, good, a very good evening and welcome to all the participants. I hope the world is beautiful on your side. I'm Nadia Kaleem, lecturer, Department of Humanities at Greenwich University. A good classroom environment always has, has some elements of creativity, which makes the lesson more engaging and interactive. The right mix of creativity along with the curriculum always helps students to innovate and encourage them. During a, a TED Talk lesson, I uh, listened to uh, Sir Kevin Robinson, and he said that in the modern world, uh, creativity is as important as education, and we should give creativity the same status as we are giving to uh, education. So, But before we move on with our today's session, uh, I would like you to have a look at a brief documentary about Greenwich University. That was great, and I am a proud Greenwichian. Uh, it is said that people without innovations are lost in winters. And there are people who have lots of potential, but because of lack of exposure, they need guidance and assistance. To provide guidance and assistance, Greenwich has taken this initiative to equip our educators with these modern innovative techniques. Uh, for this, we have with us today our esteemed panelists with loads of experience and wisdom. We have with us Ms. Georgina, a consultant advisor, Corporate Affairs, Greenwich University, Park Mauritius Campus, winner of Points of Light Award 2020 from Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, an entrepreneur, registered international trainer with Mauritius Qualification Authority, and has trained many teachers and been a part of Mauritius Institute of Education, 
a former advisor to the Minister of Health, Minister of Youth and Schools, Ministry of Women and Children, and Ministry of Gender Equality. And she is the founder and current chairperson of We Empower. Next, we have with us our respected Ms. Taira Ahmed Khan, Assistant Professor, Department of Humanities, a student counselor and corporate affairs. She has more than 35 years of experience in education and corporate sector. She worked at Pakistan American Culture and taught in Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America. She's a Rotarian and former president training Rotary 12, 2012. She led a peace delegation, Aman Kiyasha, from Pakistan to India in 2011. She has worked with uh, Dr. Rathbao for the eradication of leprosy in Pakistan and received international award for the same cause. Attended peace conference in India, and she attended several TASOL training uh, in places like Washington, Virginia, and Thailand. Next, we have with us Mr. Ali Said, uh, head Greenwich Development Center amongst the top 10 trainers in Pakistan. His expertise lies in facilitating critical thinking, personal development, stress and time management, and communication. Ali has trained and mentored more than 50,000 people. He's fine, he pioneered the legal serious play approach in Pakistan and has been a facilitator of the LSP methodology since 2015. He leads our Capital Private Limited as its chief executive and has been a board member on three committees at the Pakistan Stock Exchange from 2007 to 2013. In Mauritius 2018, he instigated 40 new teaching pedagogies for various learning environments and his efforts were lauded by the Mauritian vice president as well. So I'll now request Ms. Georgina to share her thought and experiences with us and with our teachers, how unconventional uh, means of teaching can bring innovation and positive constructions in classrooms. Hello, Ms. Georgina, hope you're doing fine. Hello, everybody. How's everyone in Pakistan? Hope everybody's doing well. I um, hope fine. You're all well, yes? Everybody's well? Yes, Miss Georgina. Very good. Um, okay, let's begin. There are some slides apparently that will be coming on as well, as I understand that um, those are being controlled over there in Pakistan. And one of the things we'd like to know is what is what does an educator, a trainer, a lecturer, what do you think is your role? This is something that we all, why did we go into education? Why did we choose to become who we are and to go ahead and try and help the future leaders? Because when you're imparting knowledge, it's not just a matter of reading the textbook, okay? So if we can have some of the slides come on, please. Um, I was told somebody would be controlling those from back in Pakistan. Um, and this is something we must all stop and think about. Think about what is your role as the educator? And how do you see, how do you define your role when you are in front of your classroom or in front of your uh, PC if we're conducting something online? Uh, next slide, please. That is exactly what I'm asking you. Um, what is your role in the next slide? Mr. Nawaz, you said you were going to uh, control the slides. Okay, we'll carry on. Stop and think, what, what do you want to do with your, um, your classroom style? What is going to be your, your way of grabbing the attention of the students? Okay, next slide, please. How do you grab their attention? Do you have any special techniques? Some, something for you to be thinking about. When you walk into a classroom, what do you want to be remembered for by your students? Each group is different. Each class is special. They each have their own needs. So you as the educator, the facilitator, the trainer, how are you going to grab their attention and keep it? That's the important thing, keeping their attention. One or two techniques that I've used and I find help, one is walking in and standing on the table. Stand on the table. They'll have to look up to you then. They'll think, what are they doing? What is this person doing? Do not be somebody who's afraid of their students. Tell your students to give themselves an A as you start the class. This will motivate them. 
give them an A straight away. Of course, metaphorically speaking, I don't mean def, you know, just give them an A for the sake of it. Tell them to be um, in themselves proud of who they want to become and where they're going. And you, your role as the educator is to guide them by, by communicating correctly what you want them to learn. And it's not just book style, not just the text. Instill in them their own self-belief. Tell them that they're going to succeed. Encourage them, communicate with them. And this way, your students will learn and they will want to also, not just for themselves, but for you as their lecturer, the trainer, facilitator. They'll want to um, please you. They want to make sure that they do not let you down. Remind them if they fail, you failed as well. So how are you going to be creative and keep their attention all the way through every session? Next slide, please. Our role is not just to recite the text, it's also to teach for the students. Each classroom is different, each student is different. Each one will learn at their own pace. So you, as the educator, what method are you going to use to make sure they remember you as well as your lesson for being somebody who has guided them through their career, somebody who has guided them to become the leader of tomorrow, because that's what we're all aiming for. Make sure that our students do get through their final assessments, exams, whatever we're preparing them for, and then they can come out as proud leaders of tomorrow. So remember, we teach for the students. And that depends on our own techniques. What are your, your techniques going to be? We have to be innovative. We have to be creative. We have to find methodology that will uh, grab the attention and keep the attention of the student, as we've already said. So it's not a matter of just reading the textbook. Set them some project work. Give them some group work. Allow them to go out and discover what has to be done. Send them the work in advance, tell them to prepare, and then come back and they take it in turn to explain to their peers and their, and their classmates what they have understood from that text or what they have understood from that uh, new chapter you're working on. Make them act the role that they're learning. Of course, this depends on the subject, but decide, are you going to be standing in front of the class reading the text? Are you going to be giving them work to do and sharing with them? Are you going to be their um, trainer, coach? Which role do you want to take? But remember, a teacher at the moment is not just sharing a book. We have to go beyond that. Next slide, please. And this can be done by assessing the, the students' unique needs. This is the only way that we must remember there is not one size that fits everybody. Allow the students to use um, online media. Show some slides. Show some small um, uh, videos that will encourage them to learn by seeing and doing. And at the same time, share some anecdotes with them. Make them remember that you two are human and that you're there to help them. Find the ways that you will think will be um, an activities, activity-based learning, which is much more conducive to today's world. And, the, and the, the more we work with young as well as adult learners, by bringing them into the classroom with us, rather than just giving them the facts and figures, they will remember the course with more enthusiasm. Next slide, please. As I said, make them live it. Learn through activities, learn by doing, having project work, having um, teamwork, having assessments, make them visit places, make them find out the reality of being a student as well as the future leader, as well as um, either running their own business 
or being an employee and encourage guest speakers to come in as well so that they can interact with other people and find out from true life experiences what it is like on that particular course, what will be the outcome for them when they finish and what is available out there for them as the young leaders of tomorrow or progressive leaders of tomorrow. Next slide, please. We must also remember that our own ourselves as teachers must constantly evolve with time. We are, we are now much more online as we're doing today. There's a lot more um, ways of looking at our teaching experiences and the principles remain the same, that we are the teacher, we are imparting knowledge. However, the way we do it has to become more creative. The way we do it has to become more innovative. The way to do it has to fit into the 21st century. Next slide, please. We've already mentioned about using different slides um, get the, the students to meet people, get the students to be more proactive. Maybe you want to send them the work out in advance and they come back and share. Um, the, the whole idea that, yes, we will cover every topic on the course and each week can be different, each session can be different. It's just a matter of how you decide to do it as the lecturer, the teacher, the trainer, but you yourself must make sure the course is covered, of course, they're ready for their exams and assessments, of course, but let the students learn at their own pace, let the students learn at the way that they are more comfortable. Thank you. Next slide, please. As we've all recently um, discovered, a lot more is being done online, thanks to the, the, the way things have been um, evolving in 2020, um, especially with the pandemic. We have had, uh, especially here in Mauritius, for about three months, everything was only online, whether it was teaching, training, um, webinars, everything was only online. Next slide, please. So therefore, all the, tra all the teachers and trainers had to evolve with this kind of training as well. We, we learned as we, we went along, um, that there are some things you cannot control when you are behind the computer and the students at the other side, um, making sure the student is there listening, you cannot control. Um, there was also the fact that some students would log in and just leave the computer on and then walk away, you cannot control. Um, there was no effective interaction because the students sometimes were there, sometimes they were not. And then we'd have the parents coming back to us as trainers and teachers and telling us, well, you know, control, your, control our children but the parents are at home with the children. How can we as the teachers control that? So we as teachers have to take on a bigger role. So we're the coach, we're, the, um, we're encouraging, we're imparting the knowledge, but also we have to make sure that we grab the attention of our students and keep it. That's our role as well. Next slide, please. Something to think about. Um, have you all used online training? Have you found it to prove successful? These are things you must think about as we go forward, because what is next for us in, in the world of training? How, what else do we do? And how do we choose our method to train? How do we decide which is the best method for us to be training? Do we become the demonstrator by demonstrating everything? Do we become the facilitator, which is a mixture? Do we have the method of having, you know, the, the course outline, the slides, the little videos, a mixture of everything, and then some breakout sessions so the students can go away, work out on a theme and come back and share with everybody? This can be done in a formal style of training, but online we are more restricted. We're more restricted on the in the fact of the students are not all together. They're in their own individual homes. So how do we get them to work on projects? How do we work, get them to do some group work? This is something we must think about 
going forward. So when we do decide to teach more online, will it be as successful as having the classroom style? This is something you must think about and maybe ask yourselves going forward. Next slide, please. When we walk into the classroom, when we find the subject we're, we're training or teaching, each one of us must choose a style that suits us and then also the method that best suits the subject you're teaching and your classroom. So which, sub, which way would you choose to be? What would you choose to be as a, a tr trainer and, and uh, a teacher? What is a method that's best suited to you? In life, we've had our own experiences, having gone to our own schools and universities. Have you seen a, a style that you think, wow, that's what I want to copy? Personally, I find for me, a blended method works better, where you're communicating with the students, as well as allowing them the freedom to go and out and learn through projects, to meet and discuss, maybe carry out some surveys, do some research. And of course, this all depends on the subject you're teaching. That I totally understand. One thing though, as educators, we must remember standing, reciting just a textbook doesn't always work. It, again, if we're doing something, whether it's in the sciences, allowing the students the freedom to experiment. This is another thing we need to think about when we're doing um, a training through an online method. How do the students get to practice? How do the students get to experiment if they're not in the lab or in a, a classroom controlled environment? These are all things we need to look at for the future. But only you as the trainer, the lecturer can find your way forward you must decide which is the best method for you. And uh, as I said, personally, for me, it's a blended method, a mixture of the teaching from the text with a video to, to give a, a, something visual, to a group discussion, to a little project work, and to encourage them to learn by sharing, sharing their experiences. Something else we've, ha we've also noticed is that the, um, the, the teacher, the trainer, has become closer to their students nowadays, allowing for more communication. And this way, if a student has a problem, they will come to you. They will learn to trust and come and share with you. And this is something that we, we definitely encourage. Of course, we have our boundaries as well, but if a student is comfortable with you, they'll be willing to learn from you and they'll be willing to take that extra mile, the extra goal to prove them that they have understood you and would remember your subject. Again, a little anecdote from my background. A lot of the time I find I meet my students outside and they will still come up and they'll thank you for making them the person they are today. They will remember you because you have helped them become who they are through your interaction with, you, with them, through your training, through your lecturing, and maybe along the line you will see them um, owning their own companies, working in big conglomerates. And that gives you the satisfaction as the trainer, as a lecturer, that you have done your job well. That's my intervention for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to either write them in or wait till later to, to share with us. Thank you very much for your attention. Nadia, back to you, Nadia. Thank you. I believe that very rightly you said that until and unless uh, we just uh, get ourselves free from the confines of uh, the curriculum and the books, we cannot come up with new ideas. And uh, all, all this constructivism can be brought only in the classrooms when the teachers, the educators, they will start thinking in a new way. Thank you so much, Georgina, once again. Uh, we have with us uh, right now our 
the wise and the witty and one of the famous uh, teachers at Greenwich University, Mr. Ali Said, who believes that learning can only be done by being a bit quirky. Mr. Ali. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah rahman rahim uh, A very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us, wherever you may be from. Uh, my name is Ali Saeed. Uh, before, before getting too much into the introductions, I'd just jump right in. Um, as teachers, um, we uh, consider this profession as a very noble profession because this entails us to become knowledge crafters at one point in time and uh, later on as we progress and we start teaching kids that are above the age of 16 uh, when i refer to andragogical principles we start becoming knowledge crafters and perception crafters and if we can change people's perceptions or at the at the below the age of 16 uh, in the pedagogical principles of the world if we can share knowledge with them that knowledge tends to compound as they grow in life um, if we could have the first slide, please. All right. Okay. So my talk about today will be about uh, a subject that's very close to my heart. And uh, I think that's, that's the fallacy between a great teacher and uh, I, I would not call a teacher bad, but a teacher who's probably trying to win their audiences, which is the communication strategy that they choose. Now, we need to understand that there are two very distinct formats, and I'm sure the people that are listening to me come from these two different formats. Uh, as someone, as a student of instructional design, someone who understands how instructional design is, how content is created, and how a context is crafted, there are two very distinct uh, uh, methodologies through which you design content. One is the pedagogical, anyone who's below the age of 16. And then you have the andragogical principles kicking in where case studies and anecdotal experiences and everything around that comes in, which is for anyone who's an adult, consider an adult and is part of your audience. Now, if we move forward, uh, if you could switch the slide, um, I. I know we were handicapped here and the level of interactivity is limited, but those of you who are listening to me, if you can quickly grab a pen or pencil, and I just want you to look at this picture. I want you to look at this picture for a good 10 seconds. Just look at this picture for a good 10 seconds. Okay, now that you've looked at this picture for a good 10 seconds, I want you all to close your eyes. Please close your eyes, otherwise the experiment would not work. I want you to close your eyes and please listen carefully to the words that I say. Dream. Sleep. Night. Mattress. Snooze. Not, tired, night, artichoke, alarm, night, nap, snore, and pillow. Now I'll give you, I'll give you a minute to write them down. If you could just quickly write down, you can open your eyes now and write down every word that you can remember from the words that I said. All right, my, my experience uh, of you know, having a large audience uh, from the communications design workshops that I've uh, carried out is that 
the majority, 70 odd percent of the people will be able to remember only five of the words that I've said. Um, only 10 to 15 percent will be able to write down more than seven words and only a very small minority of five percent of my audience listening to me right now will be able to go beyond the 10 word mark. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many words you remembered. I'm, this is not a test for retention. What I'm trying to test is strategy number one. The first strategy that I want you to remember is that I'm sure everyone who's listening to me right now can gauge that I said the word night more than once. Now, there, there are probably people here who think I've said it twice. There are people here who think I've said it thrice. And I'm sure there's one person in the audience who thinks I've said it four times. Well, that doesn't matter either. What matters is that most of you remember that I said the word night more than one time. And that is the first element that I want you to remember. This is the first pillar of communication. Anything that is repeated within the adult space or within a classroom at school, anything that is repeated is 100% registered. That's exactly why a great presentation starts about the topic, covers it up, and ends at the same emblem where they started off with. So the law of repetition is communication strategy number one, especially in the classroom. Um, uh, we were growing up, so our parents taught us that different styles, different variations, and one way or the other, that finally found a a, a very strong uh, foothold in our minds. So communication strategy number one is law of repetition. Keep on repeating. No kid in the world will be able to understand one message delivered only once. So you need to keep on repeating. Strategy number two. I'm sure most of you, when you were noting down the words and you're trying to re uh, uh, curate the, the, uh, the words that I said, you came across a word called artichoke. Now, artichoke was a word that had nothing to do with the context of the words that I was giving. And that artichoke brought in another element, which is called the second pillar of communication, which is the element of surprise. People love surprises. And uh, uh, when I used to teach the early in the early part of my life, when I used to teach college and university students, I would think that only they were impressed by it. But later on, when I went into the training space of learning and development environments, I found out that even adult learners love surprises. The second element, and the only reason why you remember artichoke is because I said that word and it had nothing to do with the context at that particular point in time. So the second pillar or, or the second strategy of communication is the element of surprise. The third category, the third category is probably the most interesting. How many of you think that the first word that I said was dream and the last word that I said was pillow? Now, the same concept applies when we are watching Pop Idol, when we were watching Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent or Pakistani Idol, whatever program we're watching, we remember the first contestant's performance and we remember the last contestant's performance. Similarly, when we're carrying out an interview, we remember the first candidate that appeared and we remember the last candidate that appeared. The reason is because our brains are working in a fashion where they are able to learn or remember the first first participant and the last participant. This is communication strategy number three. It's called the law of primacy and the law of recency. The primary, the first, and the last will always be remembered. The fourth element uh, or the fourth communication strategy is that if I say, if I ask you right now, how many of you remember the word bed? How many of you think that I said the word bed? Some of you might come to the conclusion that I did say the word bed. And although I did not say the word bed, but I said everything else other than the bed. I said mattress. I said alarm. I said snooze. I said pillow. I said dream. So everything around the bed. This is where our brain falls into something that we refer to as a paradox. Okay. And in, in, the, in the language of communication, it is called the illusion of contextual 
imagery where our brain sets the context and puts in a little bit of its own flavor there and the bed was there i never i inadvertently did not mention the word bed but it was somehow there as part of your memory or your experience uh, this was the fourth pillar of communication and the last pillar if you could please get that same picture up again uh yeah if you look at the picture the picture has nothing to do with the words that i said and this is where a lot of people uh, uh misjudge uh, as as teachers uh, we often uh, you know step ahead and we forget to connect the message with the visual communique so the visual communication your body language as a teacher your body language so if you're talking about uh the independence day struggle you need to be excited you can't be gloomy and be talking about the independence day if you're talking about a war it has if you're talking about science you need to be in that pivot of experimentation so the visual communique or the visual communication and the messages communication need to be in line or need to be in synchronization if we can move on uh to the next slide please Okay, something that I've discovered over, uh, you know, over the last ten years of my life as as an instructor in different formats of of the uh, education or learning and development stream, fifty percent of what you will say in a classroom, in a training session, as a facilitator, will be lost in translation. Fifty percent, seventy five percent of that will be forgotten in the first two months post intervention and the 25 out of the 25% that they remember only 60% will be correct and that's exactly why we say augmentation is very important and when i say augmentation i mean repetition augmentation improvisation is very important um right now the schools were closed for a good four and a half five months and uh, some great schools I, I was looking at the curriculum and what some great schools are doing so what they're doing is that they're repeating half the class to the kids did the last year because the kids are coming out of sensory isolation and they've forgotten everything that they did six months ago and what they want to do is make sure that they are getting into the bound they're they're running the their background checks are good and that's exactly why a lot of emphasis on hybrid learning and blended learning is about covering what they covered in the last year that's because people forget get into the habit of accepting this as a teacher accepting this as an instructor that people will always forget irrespective of how many times you tell them people will always always forget if those of you who don't believe me just go out or onto the road and you'll see people will always forget what the traffic signs mean and they'll always run a red light or two okay can we move forward please Okay, now as teachers, uh, as human beings, um, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, leave teachers out of this. I'm, as human beings, we are taught how to write for 12 plus years uh, in, the, in the formal education system. But the, the, the usage today as, as an instructional design uh, uh, element is that we only use it for 9%. Uh, we learn how to read for six to eight years, but our usage is simply 16%. Uh, speaking, we were curated for a, a year or two years, and then we started building up on our own accents, building up on our own way of talking and speaking. We use it for 30%. And as teachers, the missing link is listening. I doubt that and unless you've probably given an IELTS test or a TOEFL test, you've never come across a class of listening skills. As teachers, we are so uh, obsessed with one-way communique because we think we are the knowledge gatherers and we are the perception crafters and we have the ability to transfer this knowledge onto our students or onto our uh, 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 classroom participants that we often forget communication is a two-way business and 45 to 50 percent of teachers miss out on the opportunities of feedback coming to them from their students so it's very important on getting feedback, listening to what they think, 
And that's that can only happen when you engage your students. And that's exactly why in adult learning, the case method and um, the corroboration and sophistication in learning has brought us to a context where students themselves give presentations to teachers on subjects that they have read on their own. So listening skills are very important because whatever knowledge you've imparted to your classroom, have they retained it? Uh, have they finally accepted it? Uh, and that can only be tested once the listening check parameter is done and dulled. Um, we can move forward, please. Okay, now this is probably something that is very close to my heart. Uh, the importance of feedback, candor, very, very important candor. If you move forward, please. As, as teachers, uh, our greatest task is to ensure that the non-performers perform whatever capacity they may be in. Now, the non-performer does not have to be a C or a D grade student. A non-performer could be anyone. It could be an A grade student who's going through a tough time. It could be a B grade student who has a problem with the subject at hand. Uh, it could be anyone. But what's very important is that we need to pull these people up. As knowledge crafters, our emphasis has to be on those that are not performing. And when, when I see classroom training, I see a lot of people emphasizing on the horses. They want to make the horses run harder and faster and become triple A grade students and A star students. But they often forget that that's not why you became a teacher. You became a teacher to pull the D students to get C's and B's and pull the C grade students to get B's. And that is where you think you've done your job right. Now, for that, you need to have an exclusive candor. And by candor, I mean a very important uh, 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 ability to communicate them with feedback. And this has to be positive feedback. Uh, if you can move forward, please. If you could move the slide forward, please. Okay, now, when I say feedback, usually this is difficult feedback. Uh, this is criticism. And when you're criticizing someone who's 12 years old, or when you're criticizing someone who's 18 years old, I mean, when you're criticizing someone who's 35 years old, all of these people suffer for something called humiliation. So criticism has to be sandwiched. And this is a technique that, uh, that is used by HR and corporations around the world. It's called the sandwich feedback technique that I'm talking about. You start off with praise. You start off with the positives. बेटा so you start off with praise so that someone feels as if he's not being uh, held down to the wall. You start off with praise. Then somehow you, the language here has to be very, very sophisticated and something that we refer to as, uh, as uh, soften. And then you bring in the criticism. And finally, when the conversation is about to end, you also end that conversation on a very positive note by giving them praise. And I think this sandwich feedback technique is very important because a lot of students give up on, this, on their studies, give up on certain subjects like mathematics and science and English and, and languages um, and accounting and economics. They give up on those subjects primarily because there was no one in their past who had given them the ability to praise, criticize and praise, which I refer to as general candor or general feedback. Um, this brings me to the end of my session. If uh, there are any questions that you would have, please uh, feel free to ask, or you could just uh, send me a message on uh, the social media platforms that we're using, uh, and I would be glad to answer those questions for you. Okay, thank you very much. And this is me signing off.
Oh, that was wonderful, Ali. You're very energetic, as I said earlier, and very smart as well. And the best part that see the positive side of every human being, every child, there must be something special and unique in a student, which we are missing out. So the best part was that. I really like that. Thank you so much, Ali. Next, we have along with us our special and our beloved Ms. Taira Khan, who is an amazing person, very energetic teacher, always wants to come up with new ideas and innovation, not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom as well. Uh, we welcome you, Ms. Taira. Please share your experience and teachings with us. Well, thank you and welcome to everybody uh, from all around Mauritius and Pakistan. It's so nice to be here and to share a little bit of uh, my experiences also with you. Uh, we have some slides. Can we start off with them, please? So these are some of the innovative uh, learning strategies that we are going to talk about uh, related to modern pedagogy. Yes, and the next slide, please. Now we have all been impacted by the present situation. And I must say that uh, the education sector has not been left behind but has uh, worked definitely in a positive manner to go forward and make sure that we reach out to just about everybody. And students now in that hybrid situation are working with us online and we have face-to-face -face situations wherever we can. So we have been doing a lot of positive work in the education field, uh, getting closer to students and getting to learn new technologies and working with it. And the next slide, please. Now, online learning has been uh, something that is not really that new to all of us, because I must say that students have continuously been doing a lot of research. They've been working at home. They've been bringing in a lot of material to classes on different topics that teachers at our university and uh, the teaching that we have been doing all around in Pakistan and Mauritius has been helping them with their online learning. So students have been bringing a lot of work that they have been carrying out. And can we go on to the next one, please? The, well, online hybrid classroom situations where, for example, uh, living in Rodericks, we were doing online classes with students uh, from Mauritius. And then there were teachers in Pakistan who were doing classes and online teaching for students in Mauritius. And the next slide, please. Now, in Rodericks, which happens to be a smaller island, of the mainland of Mauritius, which is in the Indian Ocean, there was a large group of students that uh, Greenwich University had been handling and doing uh, adult education with them. And can we have that slide where we would like to see some of them, please? These are different situations in Mauritius. And we were talking about uh, these adult students. And these adult students happen to be uh, people with families as well. And as you can see, there's a group of young people over here and they are children of the lady uh, who is sitting with us over here. And then the rest of them, of course, are classroom situations where we have been handling students online and face to face in Mauritius. And the next slide, please. Now, when we talk about uh, student and teacher relationship. The very important thing over here is crossover learning. And when we talk about crossover learning, it is coming closer and meeting the needs of individual people because people all around the world can be different. Students can be different. So a situation in the classroom is never the same anywhere in the world. So let's watch this video and I will tell you more about it.
Now over here, the sense of discipline, uh, the sense of picking up a language which wasn't their own. For example, this entire group of people, they either spoke French or they spoke Creole. And then we brought them into learning a language, English, which of course they were exposed to before, but they weren't that fluent in. They have learned to pick up the song and uh, return it back to us with such meaningful attitude and behavior, if you notice. Now, if you notice that there was a little dog that came in there as well, and he also happened to have got so disciplined with us that he just walked into this classroom situation, sat down over there, and just happened to have been part of the supporting strategies that we as teachers need to pick up and make sure that we can export to the individual who is around us, might it be human or even otherwise. So it is very important that we as teachers make those strategies workable. And when I say workable, we have to propose and discuss questions in a classroom and then for learners to explore these questions. For example, learners can go out. They can leave the classroom, they can go to the beach, they can go to a museum, they can go just about anywhere. We need these supporting strategies today to teach because young people today can offer so much to us. And we as teachers are always learners and we are learning every day. And in this post-COVID situation, there is so much of new strategy and learning that we need to pick up. And this is something that a teacher has to get into because a teacher is always a student. Now, can we have the next uh, slide, please? Now, talking about supporting strategies, one of the second strategies over here is learning through argumentation, where people argue, where people talk, for example, like in mathematics and science. And there is learning with fun. This learning develops through play, through going outside the classroom, like we see in this particular video. Can we just play that video again, please? Now, this is a video where there are students all around who are actually teaching me as the teacher to do what we call their particular Sega dance, which is, yes, which is what the community around there in Mauritius are so good at. It's their Sega music and their Sega dancing, which is actually being transferred to the teacher. So the teacher here happens to be a learner. And then we come to uh, incidental learning or being a leader. What is it to be a leader? To be a leader, basically, you have to support. You have to support a situation because leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. And can we have that uh, slide, please? So it's vision into reality. And when we talk of being a leader, the first and basic thing is encouragement. We have to encourage our learners. We have to make sure that everything which is context-based happens to be translated where we empower the youth to be able to understand those values and then project our vision. And what is our vision? Our vision is to make them go forward in life, to become leaders tomorrow to make sure that they can take our place in a more effective and positive manner. So we need to open up opportunities for them. And these opportunities which we open up for them is actually following those designs for learning at schools, at museums, at websites that require deep understanding of how context shapes and is shaped by the process of learning. Then, of course, we have computational uh, thinking. We can, we can compute things. We can decompose things. We can break them up into smaller points, into smaller ideas. 
and make them recognize them, make pattern recognitions for them. And we can leave out all details, which is also known as abstraction. So if we talk about the COVID-19 situation today, what have we actually done? We have taken our past experiences of the different kind of viruses that have affected us. We have decomposed it. We have recognized patterns. We have deleted so many ideas, that is abstraction, and we have developed new strategies which are necessary to solve this problem and solution, which is known as algorithms. So we are trying to solve the COVID-19 by our past experiences. And in the end, we refine these steps by debugging. And we leave out all unnecessary situations and add what is going to help us in the future. And this is exa exactly what a vision or a visionary in a classroom situation for a teacher needs to be. We are building leadership. And today, leadership comes very strongly from the youth around us. So what we need to do is empower them give them the lead to be on their own and to show us how they can better perform whatever we need them to perform and do. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we just recover and re-go through what we have done. So we had crossover learning, we had learning through argumentation. We have incidental learning. We had context-based learning. Computational thinking and learning. learning by doing science with remote labs. Now, this is actually experimentations that students can do in, for example, a lab. They can do it in a kitchen. They can do it in any situation where they're hands-on and they're learning because there are a lot of people who might not be able to understand and comprehend so much from theory. And we have to learn to pick up those people who are left behind in a classroom situation just because they are more hands-on people. We have to pick them up and we have to listen for this. So like it was even mentioned before that we have to pick up those D graders and make them better into Cs and the C better into a B and that's how we go on. Because that is what leadership for a teacher embodies. So embodied learning over here happens to be making sure that every teacher in a classroom handles all the skills that are present among her students, among his or her students. And every student might not be that comfortable in an entire classroom situation with theory. So if there is theory, it has to have so much of practical and it has to have the open mind and wide thinking of a teacher to make sure how she or he could best relate that particular knowledge and that situation to the student. For more general learning, the process of physical action provides a way to engage learners in feelings as they learn. So feeling and emotion with their cognition and their imagination is so important to pick up from them. We learn from them. We learn how they best learn. And so we teach them that way. And it goes on. So the development of mindful approaches to learning and well-being is very important. And that happens to be uh, important for a teacher, not only in a classroom situation, but at all times. Because a teacher is learning not only by all the theory that she has read or he has read, but also by all the practical 
that she or he has gone through. Then we have adaptive teaching. And in adaptive teaching, we can either be, it can either be applied to, a, to classroom activities or online environments where learners control their own pace of study like we have done uh, in the past three or four months. And we are still going through that. And now we're so slowly breaking into more face-to-face, -face, but we are changing ways of teaching now. And we are adapting to the situation of this fast changing world. So it is change which is most important today in the learning scenario. We have to change and we have to learn how to change better to adapt, to carry on. Because learning we are doing every day and at every step. Then we have uh, the analysis of emotions. How students learn and respond differently to their emotional and cognitive states. There can be students very quiet, yet very good. There can be students very active, yet not producing what they really should be. So there are different kinds of cognition, behavior styles that we will realize that students have. But as a teacher, I need to address them on a very one-to-one -one and a personal basis. So the more experience that I gain as a teacher, I become better at handling those emotional states that young people go through. Because as a young student, there are a lot of challenges that hit me. I bring challenges from home. I bring challenges from my community. I bring challenges from my country. I bring challenges from the entire religious groups that I belong to. And talking particularly to Pakistan, I bring challenges that Pakistan has in itself. For example, we have a big challenge of water here. Water happens to be very scarce. The problems that some of the students face because of the lack of water is unbelievable. And I have had personal experiences of handling these kind of situations. So place to place and area to area, you might be teaching a particular subject, but the challenges that the young people bring can be quite different and quite varied. When we go on, we talk about steel assessment. What is this? It is the assessment of the learning process, which is unobtrusive. So very quietly and on my own, I pick up those ideas, those problems that I notice among young people. And I teach and respond to them accordingly. Everybody might have their own little problem, but I have to make sure that I handle it in my own way without making it publicly known to any and everybody in the classroom. I write about it, I study about it, and I try and understand about it. So this is where counseling comes in, because a teacher is not only a teacher, she is also a counselor. And she's counseling each and every individual with his or her problem and trying to solve it to make him or her a better human being and a greater leader for tomorrow. So per perseverance and creativity and strategic thinking on the part of me as a teacher is very important. And with this, I conclude all these different points that I have talked about, which cover basically the new pedagogy today as discussed. We need to be more innovative. Thank you so much. And if there are any questions, you can get back to me. Uh, like we've all been told that uh, we have a website that you can uh, put your feedback on and refer back to. So thank you so much. And I hope people have enjoyed the show and picked up as much knowledge as possible. Thank you.
models those can be made for them. Thank you so much, Ms. Tahira. And no doubt it was, it was again very enlightening. And it reminds me of what my teacher used to say, Sir Abbas Hussain. बहुत सारे टीचर्स जो हैं वो फेमिलियर होंगे सर अब्बास के नाम से और वो हमेशा कहते थे कि अ कारपेंटर वर्क्स ऑन वुड पेंटर वर्क्स ऑन अ कैनवास बट इट्स अ प्रिविलेज ऑफ अ टीचर टू वर्क्स ऑन ह्यूमन माइंड एंड ह्यूमन ब्रेन एंड इट शेप्स एंड क्रिएट्स एंड रिक्रिएट्स सो बिल्कुल टीचर की अहमियत को किसी तरह से निगेट नहीं किया जा सकता एंड इफ यू लुक एट द हिस्ट्री islamic history or history of world you have seen though it seems very cliche but I, even then i Uh, quote it again the effect of the brace on rumi then rumi on iqbal and then similarly nietzsche bagza on iqbal they were all teachers reshaping and remodeling thought process not only one human being because that human being transforms generation so uh, the significance of a teacher and how a teacher creates the impact on a students it, it cannot be undermined I hope we have uh, so many questions and queries from our audience. I want to thank my audience again. Uh, so, Miss Georgina will be with us to answer all your queries. Miss Georgina, the first question is: uh, May I get some idea how to assess in school? It's become difficult to do hands-on activity if teaching to do students who belong to small schools. But the one way of getting um, an idea of how to assess the students is by either asking them questions during the session, reminding them that they will be assessed maybe after each session, or each week as you begin the next session or each class that starts, ask a student or a group of students to give feedback of what they remember from the last session. So in a way. It is a, a way of assessing them to see how much they've retained from one session to the next, but remind them each time this will be done. Um, one one method I use is that at the end of each session, I will ask two or three people to stand up and and tell us, even if it's online, they can tell us what do they retain from that particular session. Just share with us what have they retained from that particular lesson. That's one way of doing it, even online. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, uh, Georgina. We have another question from Umay Kulsum, and she is asking, "What other activities are possible in online classroom other than games and project works?" And I think it's very relevant. Very relevant indeed. Send them um, the chapter you're going to cover, and ask them to come in online and teach the subject to each other. Mm, one, way of, one way of doing it is to get them to to interact with each other, and just even online, you can have a, a group discussion. You can have one of them coming back to be the teacher, so we understand, so we can see how they understand the subject they're covering. So we set the homework is to learn the chapter you have, prepare your slides, and you be the teacher. So it's not just group work. It's not just a matter of a project. They come back and they share together. Put them into two groups, even if they're not in one classroom. They're working from home, and they come back to the session online, and have a discussion on that topic. So you're making them um, create, be, become more creative, or find fun elements to teach that topic. Make the, ask them to go and design a board game on that particular chapter, and then come back and share. Even as individuals, they can come back together because even they don't have to be in the classroom to be able to work together. Every most of us, our students, whatever age they are, they're on WhatsApp, they're on the phone. They can still collaborate even if they don't meet. So each one has their own section to do. They come back together online, and each one, can, as we're doing today, get the class to do the same thing. I hope you got the answer, Umi Kulsum. Uh, another question is, Georgina, that how can we increase students' engagement in online classes? 
again, I think you have answered the uh, question. Get them to interact with you. Ask them questions or, or make them. Another way we do it is I would say to the students, okay, this is the topic today. You're a reporter on that particular theme. What do you want to know? They will then listen and find out more and come back themselves online with their own questions. Does that make sense? Very right, very right, Georgina. I hope it helps. Um, do we have, yes, we have another question. Uh, it's, it's a very, you know, witty one. My question is when a student gets late in a class due to getting up late from bed, what do we do? And my answer would be congratulate him. You have a Hamlet in your home. It was on a funny side, a lighter note. As a, well, what we, do, what we do, it depends on the age of the student, of course. Um, and if it's a student that is regularly late, keep a time lag. And if, when it comes to like the hour of the lesson or two hours of the lesson, you add, if it's 10 minutes every time, remind the student they've missed an hour of your lesson. So how they're going to make up for it for themselves. And if it's a student that has parents, what we do in Mauritius, we have to report it to the parents. Depend, as I said, it depends on the age of the student. Okay, I hope you got the answer. So thank you so much, Georgina, for answering all the queries of our teachers. And thank you so much for your valuable and precious time. And I want to, um, uh, we have another um, amazing student with us. And she's a colleague as well, uh, Ms. Sundas. And she's here with us. And uh, she will brief you about some upcoming programs Greenwich University is offering along with the scholarships we have. So over to you, Sundas. Okay, so like everyone, I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, as we say that a good teacher can change a game, a good coach can change a life. Thank you so much to all the participants uh, who came and joined us today. Thank you for taking out your time. We believe that, you know, these suggestions and these guidance from our educational experts, you will find new ways to be innovative and constructive in your classroom. Um, I would like to thank everyone who has come here. I appreciate their effort of coming and joining us. Uh, thank you to all the trainers, Ms. Georgiana, Ms. Tahira, Mr. Ali Said, for giving us valuable insights and helping us in these tough times. Words can neither qualify nor quantify what you guys have given us. You guys have given us excellent uh, attributes of how we can be better teachers, how we can actually ev evolve as a teacher as well. Uh, Greenwich University as an educational institute has always uh, bridged the gap in imparting knowledge and contributing to the society through its CSR uh, contracts. This is one of its gesture in contributing in COVID CSR. As a Greenwich University student, I'm extremely proud and very thankful to my university for giving us this prestigious and uh, this great platform where we have a very good, uh, you know, developing and understanding. Greenwich University has developed an excellent fa uh, number of students because of a good faculty and a strong commitment through uh, Greenwich University has provided our society as well with amazing students. We are proud to announce that we are now offering a BEAD program that is 1.5. These are all the programs that are going to be associated with us. We have the associate programs, we have undergraduate programs, the graduate programs, MPhil programs, and doctorate programs. After this, we have our BEAT program. We are offering 1.5 years program of BEAT, Bachelor's of Education, and it's a 50% waiver for all the teachers and even anyone who is going to join us for the BEAT program. It's a special waiver if you have completed your 16 years of education in any discipline. We are offering MA in English Linguistics and English Literature. It has a duration of two years. The prerequisite for this is you need to have 14 years of education in any education discipline 
to continue your master's in English literature and linguistics. We also have a 50% waiver on tuition fee in this program as well. The next we have a master's in international relations. We are also giving 50% special waiver on tuition fee in master's in international relations as well. You just have to have a prerequisite of 14 years of education in this discipline as well. All these programs are going 10% off because of fall admissions 2020. If you take admission in fall 2020, you will be getting 10% special waiver on tuition fee for registered participant on any degree or all degree programs. Thank you so much for tuning in with us, you guys. I really appreciate everyone who has contributed in this small effort that we tried to bring out from Greenwich University. Greenwich University has always developed this and they've helped out the people in need. For your certificates uh, and for your, you know, uh, appliance of the certificates, what you have to do is we will be sending you an email in which there would be a feedback form. You have to fill that form and send it back. After receiving your feedback form, we will be sending you guys your email through soft copy. And if you want a hard copy, you can definitely come to Grant University and we will be sending you that as well. Thank you so much for your time. As a student, I'm extremely proud and I'm so thankful to all the trainers. Really appreciate it. Your certificates will have the same name and the same information that you have given to us in your, uh, you know, the forms that you have given us and you have filled for us. So please make sure that your certificates have the right name and the right information so we can you know issue you the certificates properly i'm going to repeat myself again we're going to have the certificates given to you after you give the feedback evaluation form in a soft copy and you can collect it from Grand university our gates are open for you all thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it and happy learning <laughs>